Hello everyone and welcome to another Stat 437 lecture video. In today's video we are going to be doing the theory for the proportional hazards models. So in the last lecture we introduced what a proportional hazards model is. As a quick recap, what we're doing with proportional hazards models is looking directly at uh, the hazard function as a point that we can model and we're modeling that in sort of this uh, way that depends on the linear predictors such that we can sort of look at these hazard ratios between two individuals that would end up being uh, proportional to one another, as the name would suggest. The, uh, in today's lecture, what we're going to do is sort of look at the mathematical details of uh, those models and uh, sort of go from there, right? In the last lecture, uh, next lecture, we will be looking at how we can fit these models in R. So hopefully today clarifies some of the technical details, and then in the next lecture you can see how do we actually put all of this to use. So with that, I'll open up my whiteboard over here and we can get to discussing the proportional hazards models. So the first thing to note is that uh, the form of a proportional hazards model or mathematical specification for it depends only on specifying something for the hazard function. Now, as we've discussed in the continuous time setting, uh, the hazard function uniquely defines the uh, distribution that we're dealing with, right? So this isn't this isn't a problem, but it is something that's interesting to note. We're not specifying something for the mean, uh, not directly at least. We're not specifying something for the CDF. Uh, we are specifying instead a model that directly corresponds to what the hazard would be. Okay, and in order to specify this, uh, what we say is that the hazard for an individual i at time t is going to be equal to the product between some baseline hazard function, which we'll just call h0 of t. And then what we do is we scale that by e to the power of xi transpose beta. Okay. Now, there's a few things to note here. First, uh, xi does not have any intercept. Okay. And the reason is, if you think about an xi with an intercept here, what's going to happen is we would have, say, e to the beta 0 plus xi transpose beta, right, which is e to the beta 0 times by e to the xi transpose beta. And so now what you're going to see is if we were to plug this back in up to our hazard function up here, that first term e to the beta 0 is going to be sort of uh, getting caught up into our baseline hazard. And so that's not going to work, right? So we don't have any intercept. But then the second thing to note is just that this h0 here can be sort of whatever we want it to be. We'll take it to be some sort of valid hazard function, and that's sort of how we're defining these models. So if we plug in an exponential hazard there, then we're looking at uh, the proportional hazards model with baseline hazard being exponential, right? And so then h0 is just chosen to be any hazard function, right? And there's a few that we're going to be using um, more often than others, and that's just uh, you know, out of convention. But what we should see is that if xi equals zero, then we end up with hi of t equaling h, h zero t, right? And so essentially the interpretation for the baseline hazard is for an individual with covariates equal to zero, that's their hazard. And of course, in any given situation, that's going to be more or less interpretable, right? So if, for instance, you're looking at uh, xi as containing some sort of indicator variable, right? Perhaps you're looking at a treatment versus a placebo. And so treatment would be xi equals one, placebo xi equals zero. In that situation, h0 corresponds to the hazard in the placebo group. And then the hazard in the treatment group is going to be e to the beta one times by uh, h0 of t, right? And this would be the placebo. And then this whole piece with the multiplication is equal to the uh, treatment or the hazard for these uh, different groups, right? So <clears throat> that's the basic idea is all we have to do is specify this sort of form here. We include whatever covariates we'd like to and uh, the model for the baseline hazard is chosen based on what seems appropriate for when xi equals zero, okay? Now, the uh, choices for the baseline hazard are sort of up to us, right? We can choose whatever we want them to be. And we've discussed a few different uh, distributions that are common, right? So we had pointed out 
that we can use a y bulb, an exponential, the uh, log normal, and the log logistic as well. And so choosing any one of these sort of gives us a specific form for the hazard, right? Each of these has their own hazard function and uh, you know you can look up what that is and then plug in the different hazard values there. But the big problem becomes that uh, it's oftentimes gonna be difficult to find a parametric model that fits exactly right or one that's sort of as convincing as we need it to be, right? Very frequently, one of these four will be uh, sort of sufficient, but sometimes when we're looking at it, you know, our data just is behaving a little bit more erratically than is nicely captured by one of these smooth functions. And so instead, what we can do sometimes is we can use um, what I will call a weekly parametric hazard. And the basic idea here is that instead of trying to fit one distribution, what we can say is that if over certain intervals the hazard is nicely behaved, uh, then by just sort of cutting up those intervals, we can use a constant hazard on each of these and then uh, sort of go from there, right? And so um, the, the idea would be that we would take uh, some set of points, so a0 less than a1, less than a2, up to some kth point, and we can choose whatever these are. And then on the interval, a0 to a1, our hazard, our baseline hazard is just equal to some constant, you know, I'll write c1 for now. It's just equal to a constant over that interval. Then on the interval from a0 or a1 to a2, our hazard is going to be a second constant, right? And so on and so forth. And what we're doing here is while on each of these intervals, we are constraining it to be a constant hazard, which we know is the exponential distribution, what we're allowing for this to happen is by taking enough cuts, we can sort of get a, a level of arbitrary behavior out of our hazard function that would be otherwise difficult to achieve. Right? And so if we think about what this is going to look like graphically, right, um, our hazard would be sort of divided based on where these cuts are. So we'll say a0 is 0, and we could have a1, a2, a3, and so on. right? And then what we'll have is you'll see that the hazard is going to be sort of uh, constant anywhere along these intervals, but it can wildly vary between them, right? And it's unlikely that this is the correct hazard function in the sense that these spikes are uh, certainly not likely to be seen in the real world. But what this does allow us to do is it allows us to capture sort of very erratic behavior from our hazard function without needing to specify an overly complicated uh, underlying distribution, right? So the selection is going to really define what the model is. And uh, there's one selection in particular that we're gonna spend a little bit more time with, and that would be if you select a Weibull baseline hazard. And the reason that we care more about that is because that's also going to be an accelerated failure time model, which is something that we uh, you know, have been discussing quite a lot. So um, how can we sort of combine AFTs and pH models through Weibull regression. Well, the first thing to note is that the hazard for the Weibull distribution is given by um, kappa over rho times by t to the power of kappa minus one. Okay. Now, as we've been saying, if kappa equals one, this is an exponential. And so just, you know, to check for our sake, if kappa equals one, we'd have one over rho, t to the power of zero, that's one over rho. We've seen that that's what the hazard is. So that means, seems to make sense. But so this is the hazard function for a uh, Weibull, which means that if you take uh, sort of what our uh, proportional hazards model would look like with this, right? Well, then we're gonna end up with this kappa over rho times by t to the kappa minus one times by, and then we have e, to the xi transpose beta, right? And if we want to sort of rewrite this a little bit, and uh, the reason that we're rewriting this a little bit will, will become uh, clear in just a sec. Oh, and I, my apologies. Um, this row is supposed to have a kappa on it. It's to the power of kappa, okay? Uh, so there's that. It doesn't change us with the exponential, but 
that's an important term that uh, you would have missed in a second here. So if we sort of uh, work through what this is, right, we can keep this kappa out front. We can keep this t to the kappa minus 1 out front. But then what I want to do is I want to join these other two terms together. Right? And you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. But what I can do is I can say this could become e to the negative xi transpose beta divided by kappa. Right? And we'll see why we're doing that in a second. Times by rho. And then raise this whole thing to the power of negative kappa. Right? So then we get our rho to the negative kappa. That part's fine. And when we multiply the negative kappa in, the negatives cancel out, the kappas cancel out, and we're left with e to the xi transpose beta. Right? But if we were to just call this term in the brackets here something like lambda i, right? well, now what we're looking at is kappa times by t to the kappa minus 1 times by lambda i to the negative kappa, which is the hazard function for a Weibull where we have uh, kappa and lambda i. Right? And so what we found is that the uh, implied hazard function when we specify our baseline hazard to be a Weibull, is also a Weibull distribution, right? It's just a Weibull distribution with a very specific form for the row parameter. In particular, it's a row parameter that's scaled by e to the power up here. And if you're thinking about that, if you think about what happened with our accelerated failure time model, right? It was a sort of a model where we end up scaling up and down uh, the, the, the times based on sort of an exponential here. Um, so maybe you can see where this is going. But if not, have no fear. Let's say that you wanted to fit a accelerated failure time model where you assume that ti is distributed as Weibull with kappa lambda i. And remember, lambda i is just this thing. I'm just saving myself uh, the headache of rewriting that out each time. Right? Well, the accelerated failure time model is a model for the log of ti. And we saw with the uh, within the accelerated failure time for Weibull models, this is going to give us log of the what would normally be called rho, but so in this case it'll be lambda i plus uh, it's one over kappa times by w i, where w i is equal to uh, an extreme value distribution, or it takes on an extreme value distribution. So if we plug in what that uh, lambda i is here, we can take a log, and it's going to be uh, e to the negative xi transpose beta divided by kappa times by rho plus 1 over kappa wi, right? And so if we just sort of expand that logarithm through, we see that that's going to be negative xi transpose beta divided by kappa minus log rho, or plus log rho, sorry, plus 1 over kappa wi. Now remember, this xi does not have any intercept in it. And so in, in some sense, we can think about this as sort of our intercept term here. Right? This could be our beta 0. Then this right here takes on the form of, say, xi transpose beta star, where beta star is equal to negative beta divided by kappa. Right? But this is exactly the form of an accelerated failure time model. And so what we found is that we have this relationship between beta star, which are the terms from the accelerated failure time model, and beta, which are the terms from the proportional hazards model. And so if you specify a Weibull model for your baseline hazard, then the total hazard is also going to be a Weibull. And <clears throat> if you take a look at what that would be in terms of a um, accelerated failure time model, you get this really nice relationship between your parameters in the two different model formulations. And so this can be sort of more concisely written as beta is equal to negative kappa times by beta star. But what this means is that if you estimate the parameters in one of the models, then just by using this transformation, you get an estimate for them in the other model. But really what that buys you is the ability to interpret them in either way. Okay. And that's essentially all of the theory you need to totally understand what's going on with a proportional hazards model, right? So just to clarify again, you start with this formulation here. And the reason we like that formulation is because it makes the likelihood nice and simple. Uh, remember, we're not going to include any intercepts. Uh, I can pick any hazard we want. Sometimes it will be useful to pick sort of this weekly parametric 
form, this uh, but uh, no matter what we choose, it sort of is going to work out in this way, where what we're thinking about is our covariates are scaling up or down the hazard based on uh, that linear predictor. There's the special, ca special case of Weibull regression. Weibull regression uh, is the special case because it combines both AFT and uh, pH models. Right? So hopefully that all makes sense. Of course, uh, there's notes posted to the course website that go through all of this in detail. If you have any questions at all, please let me know, and I will see you all in the next lecture.